Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Sarah. I'm a second year medical student and I'm going to be talking about the male reproductive systems physiology and about the function of testosterone as well as some other androgens. So before I start, I hope you're all having a wonderful day and your Ramadan is going great. Make lots of dua during this holy month. And without any further ado, let's get started. Um, also, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me through my number. You can text me on WhatsApp. Um, if you have any questions about the lecture or about like any of the questions that I added to the lecture, um, I'd be more than happy to answer them. So the first question that comes to mind is what does our reproductive system even do? It has a few functions. However, we need to note that it doesn't really have any homeostatic function. So what do we mean by what do we mean by a homeostatic function? A homeostatic function is basically anything that regulates uh, body's homeostasis. So you know, like we have the cardiovascular system, we have the GI system, we have a bunch of different systems, we have the endocrine system. Um, the reproductive uh, system, it mainly works in producing uh, gametes and regulating uh, other reproductive functions. So we have primary reproductive organs, which produce the gametes, and they synthesize and secrete sex hormones. Sex hormones are like estrogens and androgens, like testosterone and all that. In females, we have, uh, so basically the primary reproductive organs are the gonads, and in females, we call the gonads the ovaries. The ovaries produce ova, and they secrete estrogen and progesterone. The testes, which are the gonads in males, they produce sperm and they secrete androgens. Then we also have some secondary reproductive organs, such as ducts, glands, and external genitalia. And their function is just to facilitate in the process of reproduction, either by secreting fluids or by serving as paths, pathways and routes for the sperm and the ova to travel. Okay, so let's talk about sex, the sex hormones briefly, and we will revisit them, especially the androgens, in more detail later. So the sex hormones, generally, uh, they're cholesterol-based hormones, so they're lipid-soluble. Now, that's important because we know that lipid-soluble molecules, um, when in plasma, they're not going to be able to dissolve in plasma because they're lipid soluble and plasma is polar. So in the plasma, they're bind to they bound to they're bound to a protein which is known as a sex hormone binding globulin or even albumin. Well, let's pretend that this binds perfectly and not in this wobbly way. Um, then we once we once this complex of the sex hormone and this sex hormone binding globulin or albumin and once it arrives at the cell membrane of the cell that it's going to enter, the sex hormone binding globulin will detach from, uh, sorry, the sex hormone will detach from the sex hormone binding globulin, and it's going to pass, it's freely diffuse through this plasma membrane because the plasma membrane is also lipophilic. Inside the cell, the sex hormone binding, binding globulin will again attach to an androgen receptor, and this time it's going to bind perfectly. In, and once it attaches to the antigen receptor, it's going to translocate to the nucleus. And in the nucleus, it's going to uh, affect the transcription of certain genes coding for certain proteins. And then you're going to have the pro uh, transcription of tra and eventually translation of those proteins. Now, what do these proteins do? Uh, they have a few different functions. So they're a little different in males and a little different in females. In females, they're going to cause the enlargement of breasts. They're going to cause the growth of pubic hair. And in males, they're going to cause the deepening of the voice, growth of facial hair, increase in muscle bulk. And essentially, these hormones are really important in puberty. So once like an influx in these hormones is going to like cause the onset of puberty which is where you would have all of these secondary sex characteristics presenting. Now, in estrogens, we have three main estrogens. So we have estradiol, we have estriol, and we have estriol. Um, estradiol here is the most potent one out of these three. Then, then it's estrion, and then finally it's estriol. Now, the androgens, which are more important for this lecture, in androgens, we have dehydroepiandosterone, which is converted to androstenedione, which is then converted to testosterone, and then testosterone will be converted to dihydrotestosterone. Uh, this conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone takes place uh, 
in the presence of this enzyme known as 5-alpha reductase. Uh, this enzyme is really important and we're gonna come back to it again and again. So remember this enzyme and that it's involved in the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Dihydrotestosterone is the most potent out of all the androgens. And now as for testosterone, which is the main one we could say out of all the androgens that we really need to talk about. Uh, the main thing about it, okay, so these are some points that we need to note, and that is that it's made in the testes. And again, we'll talk about this more. And it's important for the development, preservation, and transport of sperm. So these are your primary sex characteristic, prim sex characteristics. Primary sex characteristics um, pertain to, again, they pertain to the development, preservation, transport of sperm because that's the sperm is what's going to cause fertilization. And that is the main goal of the reproductive system. Um, testosterone is also important for the development of deep voice, increased bone and muscle mass, and male hair and pattern in males. These are your secondary sex characteristics. And these are, um, they're first seen during puberty, which is when you have an increased concentration of testosterone in the body. Now we said that testosterone is converted to 5-alpha reductase, uh, sorry, so converted to dihydrotestosterone in the presence of 5-alpha reductase. So this enzyme is really important. And we said that dihydrotestosterone is the most potent out of all the androgens. And it plays an important role in the development of the external genitalia during fetal life. It also has strong growth promoting effects in its target origin organs. So those are like the changes you would see in puberty, you know, in the skin and the fat tissue um, and in the prostate as well. And that's where you would also find 5-alpha reductase because, again, you would need to convert testosterone to dihydrotestosterone uh, in the presence of 5-alpha reductase. Now we're going to talk a little bit embryology. And the first thing that I want, the main thing that I want to talk about in embryology is sex determination. So basically, before six weeks, six weeks is when uh, six weeks in utero is when sex determination takes place. Before that, you have two ducts in the fetus or in the embryo, actually. So you have the malarian duct and you have the Wolfian duct. Now, the malarian, malarian duct is going to differentiate into the female internal genitalia, so the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the, um, the cervix, all of that. And the Wolfian duct will uh, develop into the male internal genitalia, so in the into the epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicles, all of that. Then you also have this bipotential gonad. It's bipotential because it has the cortex and the medulla. The cortex uh, would form the, the the ovaries and the medulla would form the testes. So if uh, if the baby is a male, so how do we know the baby is a male? Well, we have the chromosomes, right? So there's XX or XY. XX is female, XY is male. So if you if the baby has XY chromosomes, then we know the body will know it's a male. And instead of uh, like keeping the gonadal cortex, it's going to keep the gonadal medulla, which gives the testes. And the gonadal cortex will involute or regress. So you won't have the formation of ovaries because you don't want two different gonads in the same body. And the Y chromosome um, also carries the SRY gene, which is the sex determining gene. And that is what causes this. So because of the presence of the sex determining gene on the Y chromosome, you have the involution, un involution of the gonadal cortex and the gonadal med medulla. It is, it, it is preserved and you get the testes. Now, once you, because, of, uh, because it's an XY chromosome and it's male, the malarian duct is also going to involute. How does that happen? Uh, I think that's on the next slide. Okay, yeah, we're going to talk about that, but I'll just briefly mention it right now because uh, it's it makes more sense. It goes in flow like that. So because uh, you have the testes forming now instead of the ovaries, the testes are going to have two types of cells. Those cells are actually, I'll show you. So those cells are Sertoli cells and Leydig cells. So Sertoli cells secrete something called the anti-malarian hormone, which causes the regression of the malarian duct. And the Leydig, this is, again, this is how the regression of 
the malarian duct takes place. And we said the malarian ducts are what are responsible for the form formation of the female internal genitalia. So now you will not have the formation of the female internal genitalia, but you still need the Wolfian duct to develop into the male internal genitalia. So what's going to stimulate that? Well, that's where your lytic cells come in and they secrete testosterone. That testosterone can work on its own or it can convert it to dihydrotestosterone on its own. It's going to influence the development of the Wolfian duct into these male internal genitalia features, which are the epididymis, the vas deferens, the seminal vesicles, and the ejaculatory ducts. And it's going to be converted to dihydrotestosterone by what hormone? 5-alpha, uh, sorry, enzyme, 5-alpha uh, reductase. And dihydrotestosterone, as we mentioned, is going to affect the development of the external genitalia, which are the penis, the scrotum, and the prostate. So here you can see the SRI protein in the male embryo directs the medulla. It's bipotential gonad to develop into testes. Yes, we discussed that. Antimalarian hormone from the testes released by the Sertoli cells is going to cause the malarian duct to regress. And the testosterone released from the testes from the lytic cells in particular, is going to convert the Wolfian duct into the male internal genitalia, which are the seminal vesicles, the vas deferens, and the epididymis. And dihydrotestosterone is going to form the penis, the scrotum, and the prostate. Um, yeah. Now, again, we keep mentioning this enzyme, and its deficiency also, is also important for us to remember because if we don't have 5 alpha reductase. We're still going to have normal internal genitalia development. Why is that? Because internal genitalia development is dependent on testosterone and not really dependent on dihydrotestosterone. So you still have to stop testosterone, but you can't convert it to dihydrotestosterone. Because you cannot convert it to dihydrotestosterone, you're going to have ambiguous external genitalia. I know this says internal. This is supposed to say external genitalia. Um, I'll fix that when I send these slides. Oops. Um, just a second, I'll just write it here so it's not confusing. So this is supposed to be external. I hope my handwriting is legible. External genitalia, not internal genitalia. Um, it at puberty, because I said that you have increased levels of puberty, uh, increased levels of testosterone at puberty, which is why you see all of these features of puberty. Um, when it when that testosterone increases, you're going to see masculinization. So the patient uh, the patient will develop like you know you're going to start developing the penis. Um, I'll I'll be it'll be a bit smaller. Like it'll be something called something we call a microphallus. A microphallus is small penis, like as the name suggests. Um, and one important thing about these patients is that they still have XY chromosomes, so they're not female. They're not female, so they're they are males. However, because at birth their external genitalia is ambiguous, it's going to appear females. It's going to appear like this. They're going to have a blind ending vaginal pouch because their external genitalia didn't manage to develop properly. And so there's like this kind of understanding in. Uh, reproductive physiology that the quote unquote default is female genitalia. So if you do not have the development of the male genitalia, the patient will present with female genitalia. But again, it is not female genitalia because they are still going to have all of this internal genitalia that is male. And you would you would know that this patient is a male because they're going to, it's usually going to be, this case scenario will be something like there's a teenager, teenage girl who is brought in by her parent, or if she's like 18, she's go, she goes in herself to the gynecologist and she reports that she's not having her periods and there's like increased virilization. So like there, you know, masculine features are appearing, her voice is deepening. There's a male pattern growth on her body. There's male pattern baldness. And they'll do like some examinations and they'll find that she has a blind ending vaginal pouch and they might do some imaging studies and they'll find that she actually does not have any female internal genitalia. And you will see a micro a microphallus. So this is your micro, oops, my bad. This is your microphallus. Um, and then you will know that this patient most likely has 5-alpha reductase deficiency. This is kind of similar to an, the presentation of another syndrome we're gonna talk about, but we'll get to that later. Yeah, so this is your normal development, and this is your, um, this is the development of alpha reductase deficiency. You can also see what, which if the organs are dependent on testosterone and 
which of the ones are dependent on dihydrotestosterone. Okay, so now we go back to our regular lesson. So the male reproductive system, as we mentioned, works in producing sperm and delivering it to the female reproductive tract. The, we do this because we want fertilization to take place because we want to further the species. We don't want to lose the species. Um, and once fertilization takes place, we produce a single oocyte. And testes have two functions. So they perform two main uh, pathways or functions, you could say. One is spermatogenesis, which is the production of mature sperm. It is a continuous cycle that plagues, takes place over the course of 72 days. Now, this doesn't mean that you would only produce sperm every 72 days. You're producing sperm every day, but it's a cycle. So like one day you produce sperm and that cycle began 72 days ago. And then tomorrow you're going to produce more sperm. But the sperm from that are from the cycle that began like 71 days ago, if that makes sense. But yes, yeah, so it's a continuous cycle. You're always producing sperm, but each cycle lasts 72 days. The sperm are produced in the seminiferous tubule. Again, we'll talk about this. Steroidogenesis, uh, this is another function of the testes, and that's the synthesis of testosterone. So these two functions are under hypothalamic regulation. So you have the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So all of those hormones kind of like form this loop, and that's what regulates these two functions. And the hypothalamus will release GnRH, so you have GnRH, and it's going to go to the pituitary, and it's going to cause the release of FSH and LH, uh, FSH and LH, yeah, which is going to act on the cells of the testes. We're going to look at the cells of the testes as well. Um, so this is just a schematic diagram of all the male reproductive systems. So the testes are covered by the skin of the scrotum, then the tunica vaginalis, and then the tunica albuginea. So you can see this is the skin, this is the tunica vaginalis, and then this is the tunica albuginea. This is mostly anatomy, and I would also suggest that you brush up your anatomy before <laughs> you produce further this lecture because this is kind of anatomy heavy too, but it's okay, we'll get through it together. Um, the testes are divided into lobules, and each lobule contains a network of convoluted tubules, known as, the, known as the seminiferous tubules, which are the site of spermatogenesis. So you can see these lobules. These are your lobules, and the lobules here have uh, seminiferous tubules. These are like these convoluted tubules, and inside of them, you have developing sperm. So the seminiferous tubules are lined with Sertoli cells. We mentioned Sertoli cells in embryonic development. Now we're also going to talk about them in adult um, physiology. Mature sperm are formed from spermatogonia. Spermatogonia are your germ cells and like they're the starting germ cells. And then like they go through all of these divisions, they become haploid and then they form spermatozoa and all of that. Um, each lobule has one to four seminiferous tubules. Between the seminiferous tubules, there are Leydig cells, which are responsible for synthesizing and secreting testosterone in the blood. So Leydig cells, uh, just like in embryonic development, they're responsible for testosterone. The sperm and their secretions pass from the seminiferous tubules to the straight tubules. So you can see here, these are the seminiferous tubules. Then these are kind of straighter tubules. And from the straight tubules, they're going to pass to the ready testes. So you can see these, this ready testes. From the ready testes, it's going to pass into the epididymis. So now out of the testes and into the epididymis. The epididymis has two regions. It has a head and a tail uh, over here. And the from the tail, you can see the vas deferens emerging. So from the tail, the sperm are going to pass into the vas deferens. The vas deferens is like this kind of... Um, tube, you could say, that carries the sperm oh, all the way over to um, behind like the prostatic urethra and it forms like it helps it forms the ejaculatory duct alongside the seminal vesicles. So this this is your seminal vesicle. Um, so at the time of ejaculation, the spermatozoa will pass from the ejaculatory duct. Uh, this is your ejaculatory duct into the penile urethra. This is your penile urethra. And then it's going to open at the tip of the gland's penis. So apart from the primary reproductive organs, we also have the glands. And the glands, the main glands here are the seminal vesicles. There is the vulvar urethral gland, and then there's also the prostate. So all of these glands, they produce some secretions that 
just help the sperm like either through nourishment or maybe lubrication, pH regulation. We're going to talk about the secretions of these glands later. So don't worry, don't worry, we'll get there. Um, again, they secrete their secretions into the urethra during gland ejaculation. So they're going to form like part of semen, quite a large part of semen actually. Um, and the urethra carries the sperm and the secretion. Again, I mentioned that. The penile urethra, okay, so now we can see the different parts of the penis. So you have these two parts, which are the corpora cavernosa, and then you have this part, which is the corp corpus spongiosum. The corpus spongiosum carries the penile urethra. The corpora cavernosa are erectile tissues. So when they fill with blood, the penis will become erect, and that's during sexual arousal. Um, okay, and the one thing to mention is that the vast difference, it's the vast difference passes through the spermatic cord. Um, so there's a bunch of different structures in the spermatic cord, but right now, let's just remember that vast difference is one of them. Again, you do need to know all the other scriptures, but that's more anatomy. And uh, this lecture is more concerned with the vast difference. So, yeah. Okay, so here's, uh, here's like a pretty nice illustration of the seminiferous tubules. So you can see like there's Sertoli cells and in between the Sertoli cells, all of these spermato spermatogonia are developing into sperm or spermatozoa. There's interchangeable terms, sperm and spermatozoa. And in the center, you can see these mature spermatozoa. And in between the seminiferous tubules, you can see these cells. These are your latex cells and they produce testosterone, which is important for uh, the maintenance and uh, development of the sperm inside the seminiferous tubules. Okay, so now let's talk about the scrotum and the structure of the testes. So the testes are contained in this sac of skin and superficial fascia, which is known as the scrotum, and they hang outside, hang outside the abdominal pelvic cavity. Why do they hang outside the abdominal pelvic cavity? Well, it's because spermatogenesis is a process that requires comparatively lower temperature compared to body temperature. So body temperature is like 36 degrees Celsius, 37 degrees, I think it's 37 degrees, uh, 37 degrees Celsius. And that is too high for the process of spermatogenesis. So if temperature is too high, spermatogenesis will not be able to take place. And if spermatogenesis doesn't take place, there will be male infertility. So the temperature of the testes is three degrees Celsius lower than the core temperature of the body. And this is, again, because you don't want to impair the process of spermatogenesis. So that's why they hang outside the abdominal pelvic cavity in the sac of skin, known as the scrotum. Again, the lower temperature of the testes is also achieved by these factors, which are the wrinkling of the scrotal skin by the dartus muscle. So Wait, I think you can see the dartus. Okay, yeah, you can see this is the dartus muscle over here. And it like contracts and that wrinkles the skin. And that kind of creates the surface area for the dissipation of heat. The testis, uh, testes are also elevated by the cremaster muscle, which is the skeleton, which is a skeletal muscle. Again, this also helps in lowering the temperature of the testes. And then there's a countercurrent heat exchange mechanism established by the pampiniform venous plexus. So there's a venous plexus in the testes formed by the spermatic veins. And because it's like super convoluted and it's a plexus, it creates the surface area for, um, for the dissipation of heat. So again, you're doing the same thing. You don't want like straight veins. So it's, it's not like straight veins. It's like a bunch of veins, like they're like going all over and this is probably not what veins look like, but I'm just trying to show like there's a bunch of surface area created. So this is this is going to create more surface area than like one straight vein, okay? And this is going to cause the dissipation of heat. And again, you lower the temperature. Um, now, some cases, there are some cases when you would have high testicular temperature, for example, in fever, like you, you can't really do anything about it because the body temperature increases. And the blood running in the veins is also going to increase in temperature. So comparatively, like it's still going to be lower than body temperature, but it's going to be high enough that there's going to be problems with spermatogenesis and other thermoregulatory dysfunction as well. So maybe like problems in like the thermoregulatory centers in the brain. And because of that, like, or even like sometimes people who work in really hot environments, 
for example, bakers or uh, yeah, like people in those professions who are really exposed to a lot of heat, they can have problems with spermatogenesis. They might even have infer uh, in infertility. Yeah. Um, steroidogenesis will not be affected because uh, steroidogenesis is not really dependent on heat. This this whole kind of like arrangement is just for spermatogenesis. Okay, so blood supply to the testes. We're doing a lot of anatomy today. I don't know why. Um, arteries and veins supplying the testes have a unique torches con conformation. We talked about that. So they're all like, ooh, whatever. Um, the blood coming in from the arteries has a high temperature. So it's 36.5 degrees Celsius, which we said is too hot. The, so from the arteries, the blood will pass. So you have the arteries. The blood is going to pass to the veins, but it's still going to be hot because there's like not enough dissipation of heat. Like even if your arteries are all convoluted like this, you need even more dissipation of heat. So even the veins are all convoluted. Yeah. And this allows for the dissipation of heat. Again, I mentioned that 20 times. Don't forget this, please. And you can see the blood vessels over here. So this is like, these are your veins, the arteries are like behind it. Um, and these veins allow you to lower the temperature of the blood. Okay, now there's the impair impairment of spermatogenesis due to high temperatures. There's two main causes that we can talk about. So there could be fever. Again, there could be thermal regulatory dysfunction, or maybe the person is just exposed to high heat, um, high temperature, sorry. And then there's this condition known as undescended testes. So it's called cryptorchidism. Um, this condition usually presents in different, like in various syndromes, um, and we're going to see it in a few syndromes as we go on. This is also seen in uh, five alpha reductase deficiency. Wait, let me see if, yeah, because yeah, you can see over here. So instead of the testes being lower in the scrotum, you can see that they're still up here in the abdominal pelvic cavity, and this essentially has to do with because dihydrotestosterone is also important in the descent of the testes through the inguinal canal into the scrotal skin. So if you have a deficiency of uh, five alpha reductase, you're gonna have impaired descent of the testes into the scrotal skin. And because of that, the testes will be up here. Now, what are the implications of this? Well, again, it's going to be impaired spermatogenesis. So the testes must descend, into, must descend into the scrotum at birth or at least six months after birth. If the testes fail to descend and remain in the abdominal pelvic cavity, there will be sterility. So you can see that this is your inguinal canal. The testicle is supposed to descend through this um, inguinal canal into the scrotal skin. Um, but like in this case for like maybe an I5 alpha reductase deficiency or a few other syndromes, it doesn't do that. So it remains in the abdominal pelvic cavity because of that, there will be sterility. And this is the normal, so it's supposed to descend like this. And that's your scrotum. Now we're going to talk about the seminiferous epithelium. So the testis we mentioned is divided into 300 lobules. Each lobule has one to four seminiferous tubules. These lobules make up 80 to 85 percent of the testicular mass. The basal layer of the tubule is lined with Sertoli cells. So you can see these huge cells. They're Sertoli cells and they're going all the way from the basal lamina to the lumen, which is where you're going to have mature sperm. So in between the Sertoli cells, you can see these developing um, uh, spermato spermatozoa. You can see the germ cells over here, which are the spermatogonia. And then you have like primary spermatocytes, secondary sper spermatocytes, spermatids, all of that. Um, now, these Sertoli cells maintain a connection with these developing sperm through cytoplasmic bridges. So you have these cytoplasmic bridges in between, and they help kind of bind the two different types of cells together, namely the Sertoli cells and the sperm, developing sperm. There are also tight junctions formed between the Sertoli cells and they form the blood testis barrier. So now the blood testis barrier is a very important thing that you need to know about. Um, this blood testis barrier prevents large molecules and immune cells from passing into the adluminal compartment from the interstitium. So this is your interstitium, and this is your luminal compartment where you have these sperm. And we'll talk about the blood testis barrier and why it's important and why we don't want these molecules and immune cells 
going in here, okay? Um, then you have these steroids and paracrine proteins that can pass through here because, um, well, like they're lipophilic and it just, you know, you kind of need those proteins. They're not, um, those substances, they're not that big. They can pass through and um, they're very important for spermatogenesis. And they also help regulate the function between the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that function kind of goes. Like, I know I'm saying like, we're going to see a lot of things. And Okay. Um sorry about that. So now we're we were talking okay, yeah, we were talking about uh the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells. Yeah. So they have some functions and that there needs to be some regulation between them. Then there is going to be some fluid found in the seminiferous tubules and it has a lower concentration of proteins and glucose, but it's rich in androgens, estrogens, potassium, and also glutamate and aspartate. Um yeah. So now this is the blood test sparrier. So we said that there's tight junctions between the Sertoli cells that prevent large molecules and immune cells from passing through. The dividing germ cells we said are present here. So this is your spermatogonium. And you can see that this tight junction actually exists ap after the spermatogonium. So this is still the Sertoli cells. These are two Sertoli cells and they form tight junctions like after you have the spermatogonium. Now, why is that? Okay, so spermatogonium is a 46 XY cell, which is a normal, like the normal somatic cell, right? But then it's going to divide and it's going to divide, it's going to undergo my my meiosis and meiotic divisions, as we know, are haploid divisions. So they will cause the nucleus of the cell to become haploid. And that's the next cell that's going to going to be produced as a haploid cell, but that's what you need. You need haploid cells. Um, you need the, what do you call it, gametes to be haploid because then you would have all of these chromosomal problems. So this cell and all of these other cells, they're 23X or Y. They're 23X or 23Y, it depends. It really depends. Um, and because of that, now this is not something that the body usually encounters. So the immune cells in the body are going to look at these cells and they're going to be like, something's wrong with these cells because they're not like normal body cells. And they're going to recognize them as foreign. And when they recognize them as foreign, they're going to start attacking them. And if they attack them, you're going to have sterility. Because of that, um, the the Sertoli cells form this, these tight junctions because they want to protect these developing spermatozoa and they don't want them, like the body, to have an autoimmune reaction uh, towards their own cells, towards its own cells. Uh, even though, like, yeah, these are their body's own cells, but it doesn't recognize them as so because of the immune system. So, yeah, just to avoid that, we form these tight junctions. That's the blood testis barrier. That's the whole function of the blood testis barrier. Um, yeah, and that's what's explained over here. So you can read that if you want. Um, oh, also antibodies against sperm are found after vasectomies. Vasectomies are the ligation of the vas deferens, which is it's like a it's kind of like a permanent process of uh, what do you call it contraception. And after vasectomy, you're not immediately not going to have any sperm. Like there will be some sperm. So you, I think you have to like wait a few days or something. I know I shouldn't say that, but you have to wait a few days um, just to make sure like all of the sperm has been cleared. And I think you can do that through like certain tests at the hospital. But again, it's not like what we're talking about here is that you will find some antibodies against the sperm after vasectomies because you're kind of like cutting and ligating. And that might like lead to some blood going into um, going into like the route of the sperm and there will be some antibodies formed against the sperm. And you can also see that in testicular injuries or even in autoimmune diseases. Okay, so what's the role of the Sertoli cells? We said they play an important role in spermatogenesis because they're kind of like, like kind of sandwiching the developing spermatozoa between them, and they also form the blood testis barrier. So Sertoli cells are critical in spermatogenesis, as many as six to 12 sperm spermatids may be attached to Sertoli cell. You can see like a bunch of different sperm spermatids over here. 
Um, Sertoli cells phagocyte toes exocytoplasm during transformation of spermatids to spermatozoa. So these are your spermatids. They're going to form spermatozoa. There's like some exocytoplasm over here. The Sertoli cells will chew it off. Uh, they're going to chew it off, and then you're going to have your spermatozoa. Well, they give structural support and nutrition to germ cells. They secrete fluids and assist in spermiation. Spermiation is a detachment of the mature spermatozoa from the Sertoli cells into the lumen. And it basically, how that happens is that you have plasminogen, if you recall from HL, uh, not HLS, sorry, FND, if you recall from FND, plasminogen uh, is converted to plasmin, and that plays a role in like clotting. But here, how that works is that the cytoplasmic bridges that are formed between the Sertoli cells and the spermatids, they are going to be broken down by this plasmin, and this is going to allow the spermatozoa to detach from the Sertoli cells. The Sertoli cells also synthesize large amounts of transferrin, which is an iron binding protein. Iron is important for these um, gametes. And there's also androgen binding protein, which is important for sperm development. So androgen binding protein is, again, as the name suggests, it binds androgens. And when it binds the androgen, it kind of concentrates it into the cell or into the seminiferous tubule. And androgens are really important for sperm development. Um, Spermiogenesis, it's, it takes place in the epididymis, and it's the final process of a uh, final stage of spermatogenesis. And it's the development of the spermatids into mature spermatozoa. And during this stage, the sperm will gain motility. Okay, so these are the hormonal interactions between the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells. So the Sertoli cells have receptors for FSH, and they also have in intracellular receptors for testosterone. So once FSH binds, it binds to uh, guanyl, uh, sorry, not guanyl cyclase, adenyl cyclase. And adenyl cyclase is, um, it's, so there's like a G protein receptor and that's bound to adenyl cyclase inside the cell. Adenyl cyclase will activate the cyclic AMP and protein kinase A pathway. So when that pathway is activated, you can have like a few different things going on. So you would have the synthesis of the androgen binding protein, the plasminogen activator, and inhibin. So we talked about the androgen binding protein. It binds androgens and it concentrates them and into like the cells. And then you have the plasminogen activator, which converts plasminogen to plasmin, which is important for the detachment of the sperm. And you have inhibin. So inhibin is like it plays a role in the negative feedback um, towards the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and will uh, and that. Like we'll talk about, okay, let's just look at this diagram because it's going to make more sense when you talk about it like that. So we said that there's FSH stimulates the synthesis of all these things. So it also stimulates this conversion of testosterone into estradiol. Now let's move over here. So the light egg cells, they bind LH, which is luteinizing hormone. And again, you activate the cyclic AMP pathway. You convert cholesterol to pregnenolone. Pregnenolone is converted to testosterone. So you make testosterone in the lytic cells, which, yeah, we do that. The testosterone can diffuse out of these cells. It can go into the blood and it can also pass into the Sertoli cell. In the Sertoli cells, um, again, it's bound to androgen binding protein and it's concentrated in the seminiferous tubules where you have all of these developing spermatids. So you really need this testosterone and to really concentrate it in there, you make this androgen binding protein, which helps you concentrate it. Um, the testosterone can also be converted to estradiol through this hormone known as aromatase. And once it's converted to estradiol, it, it, plays, it plays an important role in spermatogenesis, like it helps in maintaining spermatogenesis and it also helps uh, like maintain a lot of different body functions. So estrogen is known to like help increase the levels of HDL, which is good cholesterol. It's also known to um, help in like, like, you know, really consolidating bone strength and preventing like fractures and osteoporosis. And also it's concentrated a lot in fat, fat tissue. So that's a few roles of estrogen like systemically, and it also plays an important role in spermatogenesis. Um, again, yeah, so here it's causing, this is how like sex hormones work. So they cause a bunch of transcription 
we can see both testosterone and estrogen doing that. Um, also, androgen binding protein has a high affinity for dihydrotestosterone and testosterone. And again, this is just so it can concentrate it in the seminiferous tubules where you really need it. So Sertoli cells also uh, uh, produce inhibin, folistatin, and activin. We'll talk about these hormones a bit more as we go on. Okay, and this is uh, these are the functions of uh, luteinizing hormone and latex cells. I mentioned that. And you, so yeah, so pregnenolone is made. Um, so basically, cholesterol is converted to pregnenolone in the mitochondria. So this is in the mitochondria. And then pregnenolone is going to be transported to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, where it's going to be converted to testosterone. And oh, this is this is important. Remember this. So during embryonic development, placental HCG stimulates testosterone release. So in the embryo, you still have, you don't, pituitary gland is not fully developed. So before it starts releasing LH and FSH, you need another hormone to come in and stimulate the production of testosterone because you need the Wolfian duct, duct to develop. You can't just wait until, you know, the pituitary is developed. That's going to be too late. So before you have LH and FSH coming from the pituitary, the placenta produces human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. And that hormone is what's going to stimulate testosterone release um, in the for the Wolfian ducts. So there's also a negative feedback because you can't just constantly be producing testosterone that's going to cause a lot of problems. So there's going to be downregulation of luteinizing hormone. So how that happened, so this is just like, because of the testosterone, it's going to go all the way up to the hypothalamus and the pituitary. It's going to tell them like, hey, I have enough, the body has enough testosterone. You don't need to produce more gonadotropin. And the LH and also the FSH actually are going to kind of go down. So there's going to be decreased release. And inhibin B, which was produced by the Sertoli cells, is also going to have a negative feedback effect on the interior pituitary in regard to the release of FSH. So it's going to go to the pituitary. It's going to be like, hey, I have enough FSH. I don't need more. You can kind of like tone it down a bit. Yeah. Okay, I need to drink water. Now, moving on to the latex cells, uh, and we said latex cells have receptors for LH, and they stimulate serotogenesis through nuclear transcription factor known as SF1, which promotes all genes, including CYP enzymes. CYP enzymes are all the cholesterol hormone enzymes, if you may recall from your adrenal hormones lecture. Please recall from your adrenal hormones lecture because you need to know that for the final. So the fetal... A uh, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis is underdeveloped. This is the same things. So the human chorionic gonadotropin released from the placenta instead of LH controls stereogenesis of the fetus. Yeah. Latex cells do not have FSH receptors. However, estrogen receptors are present where they reduce the pro proliferation and activity of these cells. Okay, so you don't want like excess you know, um, you don't want like excess testosterone, testosterone being produced. So we said the testosterone produced hair goes to the Sertoli cells. In the Sertoli cells, it's going to be converted to estrogen and it's going to come back into these cells. And essentially like you, like when you're producing a lot of testosterone, you're also going to be converting a lot of it to estradiol or estrogen, right? So the latex cells are going to kind of sense that and they're going to be like, okay, it's time to downregulate. And that's what this point is talking about. So their activity is going to be downregulated. Activation of the LH receptor stimulates the androgen secretion via cyclic AMP. Yes, we talked about that. These, uh, so again, the androgens are testosterone, dehydroepiandestrine dion, and androstein dion. The latter two are less active. The most, the, mo the ones that we mainly talked about are testosterone and also DHTs. So testosterone diffuses from the latex cells into Sertoli cells. It binds to androgen binding protein. This helps it reach high concentrations here in the lumen of the seminiferous tubules where you have all of these developing sperm. 
Testosterone is obligatory for spermatogenesis and functioning of sertoli cells. So yes, testosterone is very important. If you have problems with testosterone, the whole reproductive system's function is going to go awry. In Sertoli cells, testosterone is a precursor for estradiol production, which modulates the response to LH. For example, exposure of latex cells to LH or HCG leads to desensitization. So, yeah, so basically if you're producing a lot of testosterone, you're going to be converted to estradiol, the cells will know. Um, if you have a lot of um, LH or HCG, like you're going to be producing a lot of testosterone, and it's going to kind of like desensitize the cell. Like it's like if you take it away, the body is going to be like, no, like we, we still need the same amount to function at the same level as we were when we had these high levels of testosterone. Okay, so serotogenesis and latex cells. Again, we talked about how it takes place in the latex cells, but let's actually look at the process. So you might be a little familiar with this pathway because of your adrenal hormones lecture, but let's go over it again. So because we said that the latex hormone, uh, the luteinizing hormone binds to its receptor, this activates the cyclic AMP pathway, which causes cholesterol to be transported into the mitochondria by the star protein. So this is the steroid, steroidogenic acute regulatory protein in the mitochondria. It's going to be converted to pregnenolone. Pregnenolone is going to go to smooth endoplasmic, uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, where you're going to have this really fun pathway. So it's going to be converted to progesterone, 17 hydroxyprogesterone, androstenedione, dion, and testosterone. Or it can go through the other pathway, which is pregnenolone to 17 hydroxypregnenolone, dehydroepiandrosterone-dione, and then androstenediol and testosterone. So it can go either way, but the end product is going to be testosterone, which is the important product, and it's going to diffuse into the extracellular fluid. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the duct system. So we mentioned a few different, you know, we have a few different structures in our in the male reproductive system. We have the epididymis, we have the ductus deferens or the vas deferens, and we have the ejaculatory duct. So the route the sperm takes out of the body is, it goes like this. So it goes from the testes. So these are your testes. It's going to go to the into the epididymis. It's going to the vas deferens. It's going to go behind the bladder. And here you can see the seminal vesicle. It's going to join the seminal vesicle and together they're going to form the ejaculatory duct, which is going to pass through the, this is your ejaculatory duct. It's like right in the middle of the prostate. It's going to open into the prostatic urethra and then it's going to continue into the penile urethra and it's going to exit the body at the tip of the penis through the glans penis. Okay, so the duct of the epididymis, so it has a head which controls, the, which has some ciliary movement in the efferent ductiles. So like the ductiles that are going away from the seminiferous tubules and the testes. And there's some muscle contraction in the epididymis and flow of fluid. All of these things allow the sperm to like really go through. So they're just kind of like facilitating the movement of the sperm. There's also microvilli, uh, which absorb testicular fluid, and they pass nutrients to the storage sperm. So the sperm are still, you know, live cells. They still need nutrients to stay alive before they are ejaculated. So when they're stored in the epididymis, they are being provided that nutrition. The non-motile sperm will become motile as they pass through the epididymis. During ejaculation, the epididymis contracts and it expels the sperm into the vas deferens. The sperm spend approximately 20 days in the epididymis, and that's where like they gain motility. That is the process of spermogenesis. Um, then you have the vas deferens, which is also known as the ductus deferens. It's the same thing. It passes through the inguinal canal, and we said it's part of the spermatic cord. It forms the ampulla, so you can see the ampulla over here, and it joins the duct of the seminal vesicle, so it kind of like joins together with the seminal vesicle, it forms the ejaculatory gland, uh, duct, sorry, not gland, it forms the ejaculatory duct, and it propels sperm from the epididymis, so this is your epididymis, all the way into the urethra, and 
again, vasectomy is when you cut and ligate the vas deferens, which is a nearly 100% effective form of birth control because you would literally not have any sperm going through. So, yeah. Now, let's talk about the accessory glands of the male reproductive system. So you have the seminal vesicles, the prostate, and the bulbar urethral gland. Accessory gland secretions make up 90%. That's a big amount of semen. So most of semen, 90% of semen is accessory gland secretion. The rest is the cells, which are the sperm. So the seminal vesicles produce a viscous alkaline fluid. Um, it contains fructose, which is a substrate for glycolysis. So, you, you know, these cells still need to perform like uh, respiration. So they need that fructose. They need ascorbic acid. They need coagulating enzyme known as vesiculase. And they need prostaglandin. So when semen is first uh, kind of, the semen is first ejaculated, it's going to be kind of like clumped together. It's going to be coagulated because of this enzyme. And there's prostaglandins in the secretions from the seminal vesicles because prostaglandins um, induce reverse peristalsis in the uterus. That reverse peristalsis is what helps the sperm go all the way into the fallopian tube. So even the, the sperm are swimming, but they need to kind of like, they really need that help. So the prostaglandins help and by helping the uterus perform reverse peristalsis. Seminal vesicles make up 70% of the semen's volume. The duct of the seminal vesicles joins the ductus deferens to form the ejaculatory duct, yes. Then you have the bulbar urethral glands. So they're pea-sized glands. They're inferior to the prostate. Um, you can see that here, can you? Yeah, you can see the bulbar urethral gland. And prior to ejaculation, it produces thick, clear mucus, which helps lubricate the gland's penis. And it also neutralizes acidic urine in the urethra. And it neutralizes the acidic environment of the vagina. So the vagina is slightly acidic, and that can be harmful to the sperm. And also the urethra is also kind of acidic because of urine. So you don't, you don't want the sperm to be harmed because, you know, you did all that and for what? So you you need to neutralize the acidic environments of both the urethra and the males and the vagina and the females. Then there's the prostate, which encircles part of the urethra inferior to the bladder. We can see that here. So this is your prostate. Um, it secretes a milky, slightly acidic fluid. It contains citrate enzymes and prostate-specific antigen, uh, antigen. This is just like an antigen you find in the prostate. Uh, it, it kind of functions in, you know, we said that here you have this coagulating enzyme, which causes the semen to coagulate. So this this antigen will kind of, it will try to decoagulate that semen so it can swim, the sperm can swim more freely. Again, prostate, prostatic fluids, they function in the activation of sperm. And there is also fibrinolysin, which liquefies the coagulated semen 15 to 30 minutes after ejaculation. This is the same thing. Um, the fluid enters the prostatic urethra during ejaculation. So yeah, and it's the same pathway. So it's going to be ejaculated. It's going to pass through the prostatic urethra and then into the penile urethra. Okay. So yeah, we said that sperm only make up 10% of the seminal fluid. Um, then it contains, the seminal fluid also contains nutrients and protects and activates the sperm, facilitates the movement. So there's relaxin, which kind of helps in that. Then there's prostaglandin and semen. So they also um, decrease the viscosity of the mucus in the cervix because if the mucus is too thick, the sperm are going to have a, a hard time penetrating that mucus. So alongside the reverse peristalsis, there's also like thinning of the mucus. Then the alkalinity, it kind of neutralizes the acidic environment and the urethra and the vagina. There are also antibiotic chemicals which destroy bacteria. Um, you would find a lot of the vaginal canal is very rich in bacteria, like the, the normal body healthy bacteria. So this, that might be harmful to the sperm. So they can destroy any bacteria that might be harmful to them. There are clotting factors, as we mentioned, and then those clotting factors coagulate the semen, but then the semen is also liquefied. 
So only two to five ml of semen is ejaculated and it contains uh, 20 to 50 million sperm, which is a lot of sperm, but at the end of the day, only one sperm will end up fertilizing the ovum. Okay, this is just a semen analysis. Um, you don't really need to memorize this, but I like this, this is just something that's it's it's good to keep in the back of your head. So the volume, again, it's like uh, more than 1.5 ml. So if it's below 1.5 ml, it's low. So there's probably some problem going on. The pH should be 7.2 or higher. So it can be too acidic. We have all of these different substances that make the pH more alkaline. Total sperm number, it should be 39 million or more per ejaculate. Um, otherwise, there might be uh, azoospermia, which is low sperm count. Morphology, it, at least 4%, more than 4% should, a normal form should be present. Vitality, at least more than 58 um, live sperm should be present. There should be more than 32% of pro progressively motile sperm. And there should be total of 40% motile sperm so product progressive motility is like they can you know move forward but just general motility is there at least they're like you know they're moving like their tail is still wagging um there should no there should not be any sperm agglutination and the viscosity should be less than two percent after a little bit look of action so after you have fibrillin acting on it okay so then there's the penis so which is part of the external genitalia. So there's the scrotum and the penis. The penis has a root and a shaft and the shaft ends in the glans penis over here. This is your glans penis. There is a foreskin, which is a cuff of loose skin covering the glans penis. Um, you can see it over here. So this is the foreskin, also known as the prepuce. And circumcision is the removal of the foreskin. Okay, uh, spongy urethra. So this is uh like the urethra and there's three there's three types of tissues. So we said that there we have the corpora cavernosa. The corpora cavernosa are the erectile tissues and the corpus spongiosum is what carries the urethra inside. Um and they have they're like their smooth muscle and there's vascular spaces. Again, the vascular spaces exist not only like you know to provide vascular supply to these tissue, but also because when they fill with blood, you have an erection. Um, an erection is, again, it's when the erectile tissue fills with blood and the penis will enlarge and become rigid. Okay, so hypospadias and epispadias, again, this is kind of like an embryological thing, and it was briefly mentioned in your lecture, so I'll quickly go over it. So the normal urethral open opening is here, it's at like the tip of the glans penis, but you can have two conditions. You can have hypospadias and epispadias. Sometimes the urethral opening might be on the inferior part of the penis. So it will not be in the glans penis. It will be like up here at the back of the penis. So this is called hypospadias. It's technically at the bottom of the penis. So here and here you can have it, the urethral opening on top or on the superior part of the penis. So that's called epispadias. Um, these are embryological defects, and I won't go into much detail about it, but this is just like, you know, because it was briefly mentioned, all, this is all you need to know in regards to this lecture. You should still go over the embryology of it. Okay. Timocens or the male erection. Um, okay. So the parasympathetic pulses, impulses will arrive via the cavernous nerve, and that nerve supplies the penis. It's a nit nitrogic nerve, so it releases nitric oxide. Um, this nitric oxide acts as a vasodilator, um, and it's going to act on the lining, the endothelial lining of the penile arteries and the sinuses. So it's going to activate guanyl the guanylocyclase pathway. You're going to release cyclic GMP. It's going to re lower intracellular calcium. And once you have low intracellular calcium, the smooth muscle will relax. So there's no contraction taking place. Once the smooth muscle relaxes, there will be increased blood flow to the sinusoids of the corpora cavernosa. This is taking place in the arteries, okay? Because the arteries are relaxing. Blood is kind of just like falling in there. It's pulling in there. 
there will be increased blood flow to the sinusoidal cavernous spaces. And because of this increased blood flow in there, you're going to have an erection. This is taking place in your erectile tissue, mainly the corpora cavernosa. Um, also, once the arteries fill with blood, they're going to like push on the veins. So those veins will collapse because, you know, like these cavernous spaces are kind of engorged now because of the blood and because they're engorged they're compressing the vein remember like the veins are their walls aren't as thick as the arterial walls because the pressure of the blood that's usually going through the veins is not very high so because their walls are thicker thinner sorry it's easier to compress them so once these tissues are filled with blood that they're kind of like going to push on the walls and because of Pushing on the walls, the veins are quote unquote going to close. And because they close, the blood cannot flow out of the veins. And now the blood is just pooling inside of these erectile tissues. And that's how you can maintain an erection. There's also going to be contraction of muscles around the base of the penis. Again, this is going to do the same thing, which is going to prevent the venous return from taking place. Okay. So semen is expelled by a neuromuscular reflex that is divided into two sequential phases, emission and ejaculation. Seminal emission moves the sperm and associated fluids from the cauda. Cauda means tail. It's written here. Cauda epididymis and vas deferens into the urethra. So again, that's going to be from the tail of the epididymis into vas deferens and eventually into the urethra. This involves adrenergic, sympathetic, nerve stimuli, so the hypogastric nerve, which is L1, L2, and that causes the contraction of the epididymis. So the epididymis is going to contract, and also the vas deferens is going to contract, and this is going to propel the sperm into the urethra through the ejaculatory duct over here. The sympathetic stimulus is going to close the internal urethral sphincter, so the internal urethral sphincter is like up here, and once it closes, you don't have any urine passing from the bladder into the penis. So now like the, the body is kind of preparing for ejaculation rather for urination. And this also prevents retrograde ejaculation from taking place. So you don't want um, the semen here to be kind of propelled into the bladder. Then you have the ejaculation phase, which is the expulsion of the semen from the penile urethra. The filling of the urethra with semen, so once like the urethra starts filling up with semen, it's going to trigger sensory signals via the pudendal nerves. Um, so the pudendal nerves that travel to the sacrospinal region of the spinal cord, that's just where your origin is. Then a spinal reflex is going to induce rhythmic contractions of the spinal striated bulbous spongiosis muscles surrounding the penile urethra. So the, the, pen, the muscles of the penile urethra will start contracting and that's going to propel the semen uh, out of the penis. That's ejaculation. Okay, now that was our first lecture. Just to consolidate everything we've taken so far, let's do a few practice questions. Um, so I'm going to read out the question and if you want, you can pause and you can answer and then I'm going to Reveal the answer, and I'm going to explain why that's the answer. Okay, so in order, oops, okay, in order for male differentiation to take place during embryonic development, testosterone must be secreted from the testes. That's correct. What stimulates the secretion of testosterone during embryonic development? Okay. So we said that during embryonic development, the pituitary is still developing, so we don't really have LH and FSH. Instead, we would have human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. So that's over here. So this, this the answer to this question is B. It's pretty straightforward. This is where you call. Okay. Which of the following cells produce AMH, anti-malarian hormone, in order to induce regression of the paramesonephric or the malarian duct? So these are interchangeable names in a male fetus. So anti-malarian hormone, let's recall, during embryonic development was released by the Sertoli cells. So you have the testes forming because of the SRY gene. The gonadal medulla forms the testes. The testes have two types of cells, the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells. And the Sertoli cells secrete AMH. The Leydig cells secrete um, testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. So the AMH will be released by the fetal Sertoli cells. Again, this answer is B. 
a pig farmer accidentally injected himself with a high dose of FSH. He is very concerned since he read that FSH stimulates estrogen production in the testes. The physician explains that only a tiny amount of estrogen is produced that way and it won't cause any feminization, but rather the estrogen is necessary for which of the following. Okay, FSH, it acts on Sertoli cells and it, we know that once FSH acts on it, it activates the cyclic AMP pathway. The cyclic AMP pathway then also activates the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. And estrogen is important for a lot of different, uh, for not a lot, of, a lot of different functions in the body, but it's also important for spermatogenesis. So let's read the answers. De novo synthesis of androgens. Um, maybe not really androgens because it's the other way around. Testosterone is converted to estrogen. Negative feedback to the brain. There is slight negative feedback, but that's not like a major function. It is a function, but let's keep reading. Production of dihydrotestosterone, no, that's testosterone being converted to dihydrotestosterone. Support of spermatogenesis, yes. Testosterone released into seminiferous tubules, no, that does not have anything to do with estrogen, so it's D. A physician considers the use of a drug that inhibits 5-alpha reductase for a patient. Which of the following is the most likely warranted effect of this for this patient? It inhibits 5-alpha reductase, and we said 5-alpha reductase converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Now let's read the options. Decreasing male libido by inhibiting testosterone. It doesn't inhibit testosterone. It converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, so your testosterone levels would still be normal. Delaying male pattern baldness by inhibiting dihydrotestosterone. That does make sense because dihydrotestosterone is involved in all of these functions. Depressing premature puberty by inhibiting luteinizing hormone. No, um, not really. Increasing masculine features by inhibiting estrogen. No, it has nothing to do with that. Preventing prostate growth by inhibiting aldosterone. Um, this might work, but this is not, it's not by aldosterone. So the most likely answer here is B. A 16-year-old girl is brought to the gynecology department by her parents. Her mother reports that she has not begun menstruating yet. She also mentions that her daughter's voice has become deeper and she has excessive hair growth. Upon examination, it is found that she has a blind, okay, this is supposed to say has over here. She has a blind ending vagina. Additionally, a microphallus is discovered. Ultrasound imaging showed the absence of a uterus and ovaries and a mass was discovered in the inguinal canal. What is the possible explanation behind her presentation? Okay, she's 16. Oops. Okay, she's 16. And okay, she's 16. She has not begun menstruating yet. She, uh, her voice has become deeper and she's excessive hair growth. Okay, these are now deep voice, excessive hair growth not begin menstruating. This is all pointing towards virilization. Okay. And they also found that she has a blind ending vagina. So a blind ending vagina, it doesn't open into the uterus. There is no uterus. She also has a microphallus. Okay. Interesting. Ultrasound imaging showed the absence of uterus and ovaries and a mass, this mass, We'll talk about it was discovered in the inguinal canal. What is the possible explanation behind her presentation? The mass in question are undescended testes. So again, she's a 16 year old girl, but she's not menstruating. She has all of these features. She doesn't have any female internal genitalia and she has a microphallus. So she's at the age of puberty, like a little later, but like she's at the age of puberty. So it's highly likely that she was born with 5 alpha reductase deficiency. Because of that deficiency, she was not able to develop her external genitalia properly. But once she hit puberty, because the testosterone level in her body uh, in her body started to increase, she started to have all of these um, masculine features. And because of that, she, like you know, like there's concerns she's not menstruating. Again, she identifies as a girl because 
when she was born, it was not known that she was a male because her external genitalia appeared female. And this is a very common presentation for these patients where when they're born, they will appear female and they will grow up as female until the age of puberty where they will have all of these realization features. And because of that, it will be discovered that they actually have a 5-alpha reductase deficiency. So let's read the answers. Use of contraceptive pills. No, she's not using contraceptive pills. Uh, inability to convert testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. No, because she actually... Oh, sorry, why did I say no? No. <laughs> That is correct. Oh my God, sorry. Uh, Cushing syndrome. No, she doesn't have any features. She doesn't really have a lot of features of Cushing syndrome because you'd also see other things. Tumor of the pituitary. Um, no. So the most likely answer here is B. Okay, so now let's move on to the next lecture, which is male endocrine function. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about in terms of the male androgens are, is the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Now, I've mentioned this a lot, and you might be wondering what is it, or you might not be wondering because you might have paid attention to your lectures, which is a great job. Um, but let's talk about it once again. So the hypothalamus, oops, let me just pull out my pen. Okay, hypothalamus is going to secrete gonadotropin gonadotropin releasing hormones is GnRH. GnRH, um, so it works by a GQ protein system with IP3 as a secondary messenger, and it's released in pulses. It's pulsatile, and this is very important, okay? And the frequency and amplitude of the pulses will vary, but why are the pulses important? Because if it's not released in a pulsatile manner, it's not going to be able to act on the anterior pituitary to release FSCG and LH. So it doesn't matter how high it is. It could be like, you know, like if you have this graph, it could be like super high. But it doesn't matter. It's not going to lead to a release of FSH and LH unless it's released in pulses. Okay. So it has to be a pulsatile release. From the pituitary, we release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. They are low before puberty, and they rise during puberty um, in both boys and girls. And once they rise, they're going to go to the gonads, and males are going to go to the testes, and they're going to stimulate the release of testosterone, and FSH is going to stimulate, you know, spermatogenesis and Sertoli cells. And it's going to, yeah, you're going to see all of these characteristics that you would see at puberty. So there's going to be access accessory reproductive tissues. They're going to be stimulated. So there's going to be like secretions. Um, there's going to be changes in behavior. There's going to be the presentation of secondary sex characteristics in terms of like pubic growth, pubic hair growth in terms of um, even like, uh, what do you call it? Genitalia, development of the genitalia. So the genitalia will start to develop into more adult like genitalia. There is feedback inhibition through testosterone in males. There's also some feedback inhibition through inhibin, as we mentioned, and folistatin. I color these in purple because um, he said that they're not very important, like you can forget about them for now, so yeah. Also, let's look a bit more at this diagram. So you have the brain centers that stimulate the hypothalamus. The brain centers are affected by a lot of different things. So they're affected by age, they're affected by the, in, affected by the environment, and they're affected by drugs. So age, for example, you reach the pubertal age, it's going to stimulate the brain centers like, hey, it's time to cause the increased pulsatile release of GnRH. So certain environmental factors might uh, you know, cause that, certain drugs might cause that just like such as um, like maybe androgenic steroids. There's also some other hormones and factors. So there's beta endorphin, interleukin-1, prolactin, GABA, uh, I believe this is dopamine, that will also affect the brain centers, either inhibiting or stimulating the brain centers to cause this hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis to be activated. Okay. So at puberty, you release this hormone, it's known as leptin, and it's going to go to the brain center. It's going to be like, hey, go to the hypothalamus and stimulate it to release GnRH in, pulsatile, in a pulsatile manner. 
the GnRH is then going to act on the anterior pituitary, and the anterior pituitary is going to release FSH and LH. FSH and LH are going to go to the testes, and then the testes are going to start producing testosterone, okay? Now this testosterone has a negative feedback on all, all three of these things. So it's going to have a negative feedback on the brain centers, the hypothalamus, and on the anterior pituitary. This is just to keep it regulated because you don't, you don't want to constantly produce testosterone. Okay, this is a very basic concept, but yeah, just to remind you that there is going to be negative feedback through testosterone on the brain centers, hypothalamus, and the anterior pituitary. Um, yeah, so the LH and FSH are going to bind to lighting and Sertoli cells respectively, and they're going to stimulate steroidogenesis and spermatogenesis. Um, so tumors and cancers of the gonads, sometimes you can have a testicular cancer or ovarian cancer, and you want to shrink that tumor. These are usually like uh, sex hormone secreting cancers, and they're aggravated, like if you, they're secreting more sex hormone, and it's kind of like aggravating the whole situation. So if you want to shrink these tumors, you can give uh, GnRH-based drugs, and these drugs they're going to be given continuously. So instead of giving like impulses, like you give some and then you reduce and then you give some and reduce it, which is how you would have FSH and LH released, you give these drugs continuously. Once you give them continuously, you're not going to be releasing any more FSH and LH. And once you're not releasing FSH and LH, you're not going to be stimulating the gonads anymore. And that's how you can help shrink the tumor. Decreased GnRH occurs in patients with prepubertal hypopituitarism, which and that leads to the failure of the development of the testes. So the pituitary doesn't develop properly, or it's like there's you know it's smaller, so it's not very big. It's not at the normal size, and because of that, it cannot release adequate amounts of hormones uh, of FSH and LH. And once because it cannot do that, it cannot stimulate the testes produce, to produce adequate amounts of testosterone. And that can lead to a lot of uh, development developmental problems. And that's known as Kalman syndrome. Developmental problems in terms of uh, sexual, sexual development. Uh, and we're also going to look at the presentation of Kalman syndrome later on. But yeah. Okay, so the role of GnRH in puberty. We said that GnRH is released in a pulsatile manner, and the GnRH neurons are active during gestation. So at gestation, you can okay. So you, you can see that these are gonadotropins. You can't see GnRH, but let's say like at gestation, there's like pulsatile release, and then this is this is gonadotropin what I'm drawing, and then there's going to be more pulsatile release, and then in females, pulsatile whatever. Okay, so in at, at, in fetal life, there is there you can see increased levels of um or of FSH and LH, which are gonadotropins. And once the baby is born, these uh the, these levels of GnRH are going to start to release uh not really sorry decrease, especially during the first decade of the baby's life while well, he's no longer a baby. Then in pre-puberty, so right before puberty, like puberty like somewhere over here um there's going to be a sleep induced rise in gnrh so whenever you're sleeping there's going to be a rise in gnrh and then once puberty hits that's when you have you know all these hormones really like shooting through the roof um which is what stimulates puberty essentially so the gonadotropin hormone uh, this is not supposed to be, it's supposed to be like this okay so this is when it's going to start like increasing its pulsatile release, and you're going to increase the levels of FSH and LH, um, especially like LH. LH is going to be more than FSH. In childhood, it's going to be more of FSH compared to LH. Now, these hormones will increase, then you're going to have all of these pubertal changes. You're going to have a development of the reproductive system into the adult reproductive system. Um, yeah. And then essentially later on in life, these levels will start to decrease. It's a little different in males and females. Um, in males, it's more kind of constant. Females, you have like menstrual cycles and periods. So when women hit menopause, the levels of these hormones will decrease. But yeah. Now, uh, also there's like different high lives for both of them. So these are um, like the like hormones. So they're, oh, no, sorry. They're not like, the, they're, unbound hormones, my bad, um, and they have half-lives. So 
LH has a shorter half-life compared to FSH. So FSH would last longer in plasma. Okay, now kiss peptin. Uh, kiss peptin is just an inducer of GnRH release, and it like causes this pulsatile release of GnRH at puberty, and it's essential for normal human fertility. So that's essentially the role of kiss peptin. Okay, sorry for the jump scare, but now you're not going to forget about kiss peptin. <laughs> Tanner stages. Tanner stages are just an assessment of pubertal development. So they do these, they do this, do this for both males and females, just to see where they are in terms of pubertal development and if there's any abnormalities. So tanner stages are very uh, important clinically because they can help you like identify, for example, in 5-alpha reductase deficiency. If a you know the patient appears female, so she comes in, but she doesn't have all of this normal development that a girl her age should. And the tanner stages can really help you identify that. So let's just like, it's better to understand it. So in terms, so there's two different tanner stages and we're talking about the male ones over here. So there's the genital and then there's pubic hair. So the first tanner stage is the pre-adolescent stage. So you can see over here um, and here, like, you know, the, the uh, what do you call it? The genitals are still in the pre-adolescent stage. So they're not really that develop but they are they are like normally embryonically developed but they're not really in their adult confirmation yet um then in the second stage you will see that the scrotum and the testes start to enlarge and there's a change in the scrotal skin texture so it's going to become more wrinkled then at the third stage there's going to be growth of the penis in length and then there's going to be a further growth of testes and scrotum again this will be occurring because um at puberty, you have increased levels of androgens, and the androgens facilitate this enlargement and this growth. The fourth stage is going to be growth of the penis in length and breadth and the darkening of the scrotal skin. And at the fifth stage, you have proper adult size genitalia. So you, these, this is like the timeline over here. So you have the second stage, the third stage, the fourth stage, and the fifth stage. Uh, and there's like some gaps, so they don't really happen at this there's not really like the same amount of gap between each one it's kind of it kind of different differs so yeah um then there's also pubic hair development so first the first stage is there's pre-adolescent so there's no pubic hair there yeah you would not find any pubic hair around the genitals then in the second stage you would start to see sparse long downy pubic hair and it would mostly be at the base of the penis then the hair will start to grow darker and coarser. At the fourth stage, the hair will be more like of an adult configuration, but there won't be the area that's covered won't be as much as it will be in an adult. And then and finally in the fifth stage, it will be the same texture and quantity as it will be in an adult, and it would have a diamond shape uh, distribution, and the hair will just just like uh, ascend all the way up to the linea alba. If you remember from GI, so this is your abdomen, it's your belly button, just so this is your linea alba. It's like, yeah, it goes like down here, and on either side, you have the rectus abdominis muscles, which are your abdominal muscles, and the hair will kind of like grow all the way up here, all the way to the linea alba. Yep. Okay, testosterone synthesis. Testosterone is a very important hormone. We talk about it so much, so it makes sense that we also have to talk about its synthesis. So it's the main testicular and circulating androgen. So not only is it found in the testicles, it's also going to be found in the blood because as a main circulating androgen. So it's one of the main androgens that you're going to find around the body. LH is going to stimulate cholesterol into the mitochondria. Again, this happens to star protein. Um, it's going to be converted to pregnenolone. Pregnenolone goes to the SCR. It's converted eventually to testosterone. Now, testosterone can be converted to aromat uh, to estrogen, so estradiol, by aromatase, or it can be converted to dihydrotestosterone using 5-alpha reductase. So again, it's like kind of like multifunctional. It can produce two other hormones apart from itself. And this conversion usually takes place peripherally. 
okay, what's the phase of testosterone? So testosterone itself is um, like, you know, it goes to different places. It's like pituitary muscle, testes. It helps like the development of the testes has negative feedback on the pituitary and the hypothalamus. Um, it's important in like muscle developments and muscle bulking. Those are your secondary sex characteristics. Um, there, the, it also like forms conjugating enzymes. So like it con forms conjugates in the liver and kidney. You don't really need to know these end products. Um, this is just to help you understand like what exactly is happening with testosterone. Important thing to know is that the free hormone is bioactive. We know that testosterone and the other sex hormones, they are lipophilic. So when they are being transported in plasma, they're going to be bound to a receptor. So this is your, I'm not sorry, not a receptor, like a sex hormone binding globulin. And this is your hormone. Oops, forgive my handwriting. Okay. Um, but this confirmation, this complex, it's not active. If it's not active, you can't have all of these effects of testosterone. So testosterone will need to unbind from this complex. It's going to be, when it goes into the cell, it unbinds. And that precipitates being synthesis. So it's, it's, it takes more time. It's not an immediate process compared to your age and after stage. And really instantaneous, uh, which are compared these like testosterone cause the synthesis of all these proteins to tubules. We said the testosterone is going to be bind to androgen binding proteins. So it can be concentrated in the lumen to facilitate spermatogenesis. And it can, again, so testosterone can also be converted to estradiol or estrogens through aromatase or to dihydrotestosterone. And estradiol is mostly found in the fat and liver and the CNS and the skin and the hair. So it's important in these different organs, whereas dihydrotestosterone is important in the prostate and the scrotum and the penis and the bone. So in the bone, it's essentially for elongating bone and allows you to have tall stature. Um, these are your excretory met metabolites. It can be converted to 17 ketosteroids. These are your excretory metabolites. Okay, sex hormone binding globulins. They are glycoproteins and they're produced by the liver and they bind androgens more than estrogens. This is very important, okay? Because in the scenario that you have more um, estrogens, you're gonna have free hormones and that's gonna have clinical effects. So if you have a lot of sex hormone binding globulin, we said the sex hormone binding globulin has a preference for androgens compared to estrogens. It's gonna, more sex hormone binding globulin means it's going to start to look for more testosterone to bind. Once it starts binding more testosterone, the testosterone ratio, testosterone to estrogen ratio in the body is going to start to decrease. So there's going to be more free estrogen. And remember, free hormone is the active one. This is very important. So if all your testosterone is bind, bound to the sex hormone binding globulin, it's not going to have any effect. Instead, your estrogen, which is free, it's going to have more effects. So you're going to have all of these. So you're going to have something called gynecomastia, where there's going to be like enlargement of the breast in male. There's going to be more. There's going to be an appearance of quote unquote feminine features. Um, and yeah, instead, now, if you have decreased sex hormone binding globulin, so there's not a lot of sex hormone binding globulin in the body. So most of your testosterone is just like it's roaming free in the body. And free means bioactive. So it's going to have all of these androgenic effects. Um, it's going to go around the body. It's going to cause, in females, it's going to cause virilization. And it can cause hirsutism. Hirsutism is like male hair growth in women. Um, yeah. And uh, the increased levels of sex hormone binding globulin are usually caused by estrogens, hyper hyperthyroidism. Decreased levels are caused by androgens, hypothyroidism, and nephrotic syndrome. Okay.
Now, the conversion of testosterone to 5-alpha dihydrotestosterone, again, this is, we've talked about this a lot, but we'll go back to it because it's important. So testosterone is converted to DHT by 5-alpha reductase, very important enzyme. There are two types of 5-alpha reductase. Type 1 is expressed at puberty. It's primarily found in the skin and it, com and it contributes to the sebaceous gland activity and it's related to like the acne associated with puberty. So this is like type one is for skin, mostly basically skin, acne, all of that. Type two impacts pubertal changes such as growth and activity of the prostate gland. So this is important. Growth of the penis and darkening and fold folding of the scrotum, growth of pubic and axillary hair. So this is hair growth facial and body hair and increased muscle mass. So prostate, penis, and scrotum, that's easy to remember because that's what we saw in the embryo as well. So DHT was important for the development of the external genitalia. Even in um, pubertal ages, it's important for the development of the external genitalia. It's important for the growth of the pubic and axillary hair, facial and body hair, and increased muscle mass. Now, because this is a clinical kind of thing, so because Dihydrotestosterone has strong growth promoting effects on its target organs. These are the target organs, skin, prostate, penis, scrotum, muscle. The development of selective 5-alpha-2 reductase and 5-alpha reductase 2 type 2 inhibitors has been, which is called finasteride, is used to treat prostatic hypertrophy and prostatic cancer because type 2 5-alpha reductase is responsible for the growth and activity of the prostate gland. So if you're able to inhibit type 2 5-alpha reductase, you're going to be able to control prostatic cancer and prostatic hypertrophy. It can also be used to treat male pattern baldness because um, type 2 5-alpha uh, reductase is also responsible for the male pattern baldness. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Mechanism of androgen action. Okay, so cytoplasmic androgen receptor is bound to chaperone proteins in the absence of the ligand. So this is your this is your androgen receptor. Before testosterone comes in and binds, it's going to be bound to another protein. So this is uh, this is the chaperone protein. And this is your androgen receptor. And once testosterone comes in, it's going to be replaced and it's going to bind to testosterone instead of the chaperone protein. Now, this, this testosterone and androgen receptor complex, it's going to translocate to the nucleus. In the nucleus, it's going to dimerize. So you're going to have two complexes. You're going to have the, what do you call it? You're going to have the androgen you're going to have two testosterone and androgen receptor complexes. They're going to bind together. They're going to dimerize. And then they're going to go and they're going to cause transcription of different genes. Yeah, that's what it's saying here. So again, this testosterone can be converted to estradiol. It can be converted to dihydrotestosterone. They do the same thing. They would go to the nucleus, they would dimerize, and they would cause transcription of different genes. Um, these are antigen responsive genes. And again, because of this transcription, you would have like all of these effects. That's how they precipitate their effects of like enlarging the prostate, growth of the penis, you know, increased sebaceous gland activity. This is just all of that on a cellular level. Um, so the actions of the androgens. <sighs> um, it's important in the differentiation of male internal genitalia and external genitalia and the fetus or in male internal genitalia is um, controlled by testosterone and external genitalia is controlled by DHT. Uh, these hormones also stimulate the growth, development and function of the internal and external genitalia even after birth. They're important for sexual hair development or pubic hair development. They are important for sebaceous gland secretion. We said that was type one, five alpha reduction, reductase. Erythropoietin synthesis, this is important for the blood, bone growth, so that's how you get the tall stature. Um, androgen binding protein synthesis, this is synergistic with FSH. FSH will act on the Sertoli cells. The Sertoli cells will produce more androgen binding protein. Um, it's, they're also in, important in terms of controlling proteins' anabolic effects. So 
they can also pose the epiphyseal plates of the bone as estrogen. So the testosterone hormones can be converted to estrogens. Estrogens are important in terms of closing the epiphyseal plates. This just this kind of like strengthens the bone and it prevents, you know, fractures and osteoporosis. There is initiation and maintenance of spermatogenesis. We said that the testosterone is very important for spermatogenesis. And it's also, they're also important for the maintenance, the secretions of the sex glands, um, such as like the, um, what do you call it? The vulvar gland, the prostate and the seminal vesicles. And it's also important in terms of behavioral effects and such as libido. So libido is uh, basically the sex drive, which is controlled by these hormones. Um, this is just a diagram. So you can go over, let's just go over it really quickly. So DHT is important for this penis, scrotum, urethra, and prostate. DHT also during, you know, like after birth, during puberty and development, it helps the growth of the prostate, male facial hair, and the formation of sebaceous, like sebaceous gland secretions and acne form, acne development, you could say. It also like affects the growth of the penis and testosterone itself can, you know, affect the growth of the internal genitalia, so the epididymis, fast deferent seminal vesicles, as DHT, there's DHT and estrogen, there's negative feedback to the hypothalamic pituitary axis. There is imprint male pattern of gonadotropin, sex drive behavior, deepening of the voice. Again, this is done by testosterone. So, so the length of the bones is dependent on testosterone, but the closer closure of the epiphyseal plates is dependent on estrogen. Abdominal visceral fat, so fat accumulating over here in the abdom abdomen is by testosterone, increased muscle mass is by testosterone, increased erythropoietin synthesis is also by testosterone. So there's increased VLDL, increased LDL, and decreased HDL due to testosterone. So high levels of testosterone can cause um, you know, dyslipidemia and all these problems. Testosterone can also is also important, very important, very very important in sperm production and spermatogenesis, and alongside DHT and estrogen. So, if you recall the question that we did, where it said that estrogen has a negative feedback on the pituitary hypothalamic pituitary axis, it does, and it's also important in terms of sperm production. I highly doubt they're going to give a question that has both, you know. Um, estrogen working as a negative feedback and estrogen being important in spermatogenesis, those options are very unlikely to come together. But I personally would go for this because spermatogenesis is very important in terms of, you know, maintaining maintaining spermatogenesis. Like it's very important in terms of fertility. So yeah, but negative feedback to the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis is also an important function of, test of estrogens. So there's also some other testicular hormones. There's inhibin and activin. These are released by the Sertoli cells. Um, and inhibin is released in response to stimulation by FSH. So once FSH binds to the receptor and there's the cyclic AMP pathway, there's going to be synthesis of inhibin. Inhibin exercises negative feedback on FSH release. Inhibin levels correlate with total sperm count and testicular vol volume and maybe an index of spermatogenesis. So the higher the level of inhibin B, it indicates that there's a high level of spermatogenesis going on. Now, activins are just members of the same family um, of peptides as inhibin. And thus, activins have the same, have a very similar structure to inhibins. So at the pituitary, activin opposes inhibins actions by binding to inhibin receptors, so there's competitive binding in, and inside the pituitary, and that favors the synthesis of FSH. Okay, so let's explain that. So this is inhibin, okay, and it's bound to its receptor. Now this is, once, once it binds to its receptor in the pituitary, it exercises negative feedback on the release of FSH. Now what happens is that this hormone called activin it will come in and it's going to competitively bind to this receptor. So it's going to competitively inhibit, inhibit. That's like, you know, kind of like, that's kind of confusing, but let's, let's look at that. So it's going to come in, it's going to bind to this receptor. It's going to remove inhibit and 
Now, once this complex forms, actinin, because it has a similar structure, it can bind. But actinin has a different function. It has the opposite function compared to inhibin. So it's going to stimulate the synthesis of FSH. And alongside that, now because inhibin is no longer bound to its receptor, there's not going to be any more negative feedback on FSH release. So you're going to have FSH release. You're also going to have synthesis. So now you're you know, your axis is reset. Estradiol. So testosterone can be converted to 17 beta estradiol, which is the most potent of the estrogens, by aromatase in the testes and the adipose tissue, because you see a lot of estrogens in the adipose tissue. Testes derived 17 beta estradiol makes up 20% of circulating estrogens in male in males. Most of estradiol in males is produced by adipocytes, where aromatase activity is linked to the level of adiposity. Uh, so the more uh, the more aromatase activity, the more you know there's the more adiposity there will be because it's like highly concentrated in the adipose tissue. Bone epiphyseal plate closure is mediated by osteoblast and chondroblast aromatase conversion of testosterone to estradiol. So epiphyseal plate closure is important because again, this it strengthens the bone. Like I mentioned this a lot, but I'll mention it again, because when your bone is growing, the epiphyseal plate, um, I don't know how to draw a bone. Let's see. Okay. So this is your bone and it's growing. Okay. It's going to keep growing. And over here, I made like, this is pretend like these are dotted lines. They kind of look like that, but okay. So the bone is growing and it's going to keep growing. So it's going to get even taller. Oh my God. That's even worse going to keep getting taller. But then estradiol is going to come in and it's going to close this epiphyseal plate that was allowing the bone to close, to grow, sorry. And once this plate closes, there's no more bone growth. And this is important because if this plate remains open, it makes the bone very fragile. So it's very prone to fractures and osteoporosis. That's why in after women hit menopause, they are at high risks of osteoporosis because their their estrogen levels have decreased, and, and uh, you might see like women coming in. They have like you know postmenopausal women. They might be taking um, calcium supplements or vitamin D supplements to try and consolidate uh, their bone strength. So if you have low estradiol or low aromatase, you're gonna have fragile bones. Okay, now we have to talk about some clinicals. My favorite part. Okay. It's androgen androgenic steroid abuse. People take um, exogenous steroids for whatever reasons, especially androgenic steroids. They're used a lot in uh, athletes. And yes, they're illegal, but people still do it. This, re this leads to increased fat-free mass and muscle strength. So that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to increase their muscle strength while trying to limit uh, you know, the accumulation of fat in their body. So abuse is suspect in men who present with behavioral changes. So there's going to be aggression because we said that um, androgens play, play a role in behavioral changes. There's going to be acne. Again, this is type 1, 5-alpha reductase. So this is also DHT. This is androgens, gynecomastia, and small testes. This might be a little confusing. So let's talk about that. The HPG axis is disrupted as serum testosterone is high, which sends signals to the pituitary and hypothalamus to decrease LH and FSH release leading to low endogenous testosterone levels. Actually, I'll explain it on the diagram over here. So, oops, never mind. So this is your normal HPG axis, right? So the, there's like the brain and then there's the GNRH, FSH. Testosterone is gonna perform negative feedback on all of these centers. Now imagine you're taking testosterone exogenously, okay? You're taking it exogenously and the body is gonna be like, oh, the testosterone in the body is too high. We need to start decreasing GnRH so we can decrease FSH. So we can decrease this testosterone because the body cannot tell that this test whether this testosterone is endogenous or exogenous. It's just going to be like testosterone is too high. We need to decrease it. So once this person stops taking testosterone, this exogenous testosterone, this axis is still like askew. So uh, because it's skewed this testosterone release is going to be affected because 
GNRH is still not being released as much. FSH and LH are still not being released as much. And so testosterone is not going to be released as much. And because these testosterone levels are low, you're going to have gynecomastia, which is um, then like estrogen, the estrogen to testosterone ratio will increase. So there's going to be gynecomastia. And testosterone, again, we said, is important in the growth of the testes. So the testes will become smaller. There will also be azoospermia, which is the absence of sperm and ejaculate, because testosterone is very important for spermatogenesis. In women, you might see realizations, so there can be hirsutism, acne, best atrophy, breast atrophy, and male pattern baldness, because, you know, she's taking all of these exogenous androgens, and they're going to have all of these androgenic effects. Okay. Then there's sip 19 aromatase deficiency. So aromatase converts testosterone to estrogens, such as estradiol. Um, males born with this enzyme's deficiency, they're going to have tall stature because we said that estrogen closes the epiphyseal plates. If the epiphyseal plates are not closed, the bone will keep growing. However, these bones are very fragile, so they're going to be very prone to osteoporosis and fractures. Alongside that, estrogen is also important in maintaining levels of healthy cholesterol, which is HDL. And it also has some negative feedback on gonadotropin. So because of that, if you don't have enough estrogen, you're gonna have you might have dyslipidemia because of low levels of HDL, and there's not gonna be enough negative feedback on the gonadotropin. So there might be like excess gonadotropin release. Now, the diseases of testosterone excess. There is hypergonadism, which, as the name suggests, excess androgens in childhood cause precocious puberty. So the gonads are producing a lot of androgens. There are two ways this can happen. It can happen centrally and peripherally. So how it would present is that you would see like early appearance of secondary sex characteristics before puberty. So in girls, you would see see them before the age of eight, and in boys, you would see them before the age of nine. These are adrenarchy, thelarchy, menarchy. Adrenarchy is increased synthesis of adrenal gland hormones. Thelarchy is breast development, and menarchy is beginning of menstruation. So these would occur before the age of puberty because of hypergonadism. There's excess sex hormone exposure or production. And there's going to be increased linear growth, somatic and skeletal maturation. There's going to be premature closure of the epiphyseal plates. So there's going to be short stature. So even though like there's early release of testosterone, so the kid is going to start growing really fast, but then they're also going to stop growing before they should stop growing because of the estrogen, which is going to fuse the epiphyseal plates together. So we said there's central and peripheral. Central is when you have high levels of like there's a problem in the hypothalamus or in the anterior pituitary. So either the hypothalamus is going to release very high levels of GnRH or the anterior pituitary is going to release high levels of FSH and LH. So if the hypothalamus is releasing a lot of GnRH, that's going to, you know, uh, consequently cause high levels of FSH and LH anyway. And those high levels are going to cause high levels of androgens. And even if the, if the problem is in the anterior pituitary, which is releasing um, high levels of FSH and LH are still going to have high levels of androgens. Then the problem could be in the gonads themselves. So the gonads are releasing high levels of androgens. This can be for a lot of different reasons. It can be because of tumors. So there could be like an ovarian cell tumor or a lytic cell tumor, or there could be congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And because of that, you have high levels of androgens and they will cause negative feedback on the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, but they're still like very in axis in excess. So it's not going to be enough negative feedback. For our central precocious puberty, it's mostly idiopathic, but there could be like, you know, tum tumors in the hypothalamus or in the interior pituitary. Yeah. Then there's disease of testosterone deficiency. So hypogonadism. Um, or the gonads are not releasing enough androgen. So this is, again, a, this, this can be like a disorder of the HPG axis. So maybe the problem is in the hypothalamus, or the problem is in the anterior pituitary, or it can, which is a central problem, or it can be a peripheral problem, which is a problem in the gonads themselves. So hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is where 
there's abnormal GnRH secretion reaction. So the hypothalamus is not producing enough GnRH or it's not producing GnRH at all. That's going to affect the anterior pituitary where the anterior pituitary will be able to release FSH or LH either in due proportions or not at all. And because of that, the androgens are going to, there's not going to be enough release of androgens. So because there's not enough androgens, this can precipitate as a lot of different effects, especially like in terms of, you know, all the things that we discussed. So there could be problems in testicular growth in terms of external genitalia growth, pubic hair growth, um, development, like all of these development that you see during um, puberty. So all these secondary sex characteristics as well as primary sex characteristics. Um, this can be due to trauma or surgery, like maybe some tumors or there could be a mutation in the GnRH receptor or the LH or FSH receptors or, you know, like their confirmation themselves. Then you have peripheral, which is where the gonads themselves are not producing androgen. So this is a problem in the gonads themselves. Um, the pituitary hypothalamus are fine, but the gonads are unable to produce androgens. Um, excess androgen inhib androgens inhibit the hypothalamic pituitary axis. This may result from congenital adrenal hyperplasia and increased adrenal androgen production from 20 21 hydroxylase deficiency, lack of, which also causes lack of mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids. So maybe like from the because of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, it's having it's exercising negative feedback on the hypothalamus or the anterior, anterior pituitary, which can also decrease androgen production from the gonads. Okay, then you have Kalman syndrome. So Kalman syndrome is a hypothalamic endocrine disorder and it results in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. This is a central problem. So it's associated with anosmia. Anosmia is the absence of the sense of smell and it's caused by the inability of the GnRH neurons to migrate to the hypothalamus. So now the GnRH neurons cannot, you know, they're not developed properly so they can't secrete GnRH. You don't have GnRH secretion, your hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis is done for. You're not producing LA, you're not producing FSH, and eventually you're not producing any androgens. So males are more frequently affected than females, and they have cryptorchidism. So again, we said testosterone and androgens are very important in terms of the descent of the testes, so they're going to have cryptorchidism. There is going to be normal differentiation of the Wolfian duct. Why is that? Because the Wolfian duct differentiation takes place in the embryo and it takes place in the presence of HCG and not gonadotropins because the pituitary is still developing. So the HCG will still be released by the placenta. It's still going to cause, you know, synthesis of testosterone by the lytic cells. However, later on, once the pituitary does develop, it's not going to be able to release LH because there's like problems in the GnRH release. So penis development will be deficient um, and there will be a micro, microphallus. This is because there is not going to be enough LH, which can induce androgen synthesis um, later on in life. And the severity of the reproductive problems are variable, but usually puberty will be delayed. So remember, you're going to have problems. This patient will present with anosmia, which is if you like read a case scenario and it says the patient has anosmia, you should start thinking about Kalman syndrome. And then you should also consider all the other aspects. So there's going to be late puberty, there's going to be cryptorchidism, and there's going to be a microphallus. Okay, this is Klinefelter syndrome. So Klinefelter syndrome is hypergonadotropic hyper hypogonadism. So this is a problem where the gonads cannot produce the androgens. Um, and because the gonads, it's called hypergonadotropic because, oops, because the gonads are not producing enough androgens, here DNRH is going to increase because of this feedback loop, right? So they're like, the body's like, oh no, we're not producing enough androgens. So we need to like, you know, really turn up the levels of all of our gonadotropin releasing hormones and the gonadotropins themselves. So these hormones are going to increase, but this is not really going to have a lot of effect because the gonads are unable to produce androgens. Oops. Okay. So the testes cannot produce enough amounts of androgens, and this is going to cause positive feedback to um, the pituitary, which leads to increased levels of LH and FSH. So LH and FSH will be increased in Klinefelter syndrome. 
There's aneuploidy, most commonly due to my meiotic non-disjunction. So their chromosomal configuration is going to be 47 XXY. They have an, an additional X chromosome. There's going to be testicular atrophy, unicoid body shape, long limbs compared to the trunk. So, you know, like their limbs are going to be longer in, in comparison to their trunk. Long extremities, gynecomastia. Okay. Why would they have testicular atrophy? Again, because they're not producing androgens and you need androgens for the development of the testicles. Inequoid body shape, they have long limbs compared to the trunk because they're not being, like they're not able to convert the, there's not test, there's not any testosterone. So they're not really able to convert it to um, estrogen and like the physical plate closure. There, there are gonna be long extremities. There's gonna be gynecomastia again, because you know, they're not producing enough um, androgens there's going to be a female hair distribution there's going to be sparse development of male pattern body hair and this is again this is because you don't have you don't really have a uh, testosterone and dihydrotestosterone to cause that there's going to be greater than average height there's going to be a lack of libido because libido is also modulated by androgens and there's going to be erectile dysfunction which is again because of the lack of androgens the common cause of hypogonadism is seen in fertility work, infertility workup is because uh, the testes become small and they became like fibrotic. So they can't really like, they're like the person will be infertile because of the lack of androgens. Now, because the testosterone is low, there's going to be dysgenesis of the seminiferous tubules. There's not, there's dysgenesis of the seminiferous tubules. Because of that, you're going to have low levels of inhibit. And what inhibit did was it, you know, it, exercise negative feedback on the anterior pituitary, but now there's no more negative feedback, so you're going to have increased levels of FSH. There's also going to be abnormal lytic cell function because the lytic cells are not able to produce testosterone. There's going to be low testosterone, and that's also going to have positive feedback on the anterior pituitary, and the anterior pituitary is going to release more LH. So there's going to be high levels of LH and FSH, which is going to lead to an increase in estrogen production, which is going to lead to gynecomastia and the female body hair distribution. Okay, then you have androgen insensitivity syndrome. This is caused by a hereditary, hereditary defect in the X chromosome gene, which regulates the androgen receptor expression. So if you recall, the androgen receptor is an intracellular receptor that binds to sex hormones. Um, so in a normal 46XY carrier type, the gonad develops into the testes, which produces testosterone and anti-malarian hormone in utero. However, in this syndrome, the Wolfian ducts do not possess the androgen receptors. So testosterone cannot come into the cell and bind to this androgen receptor. Because it cannot bind to this androgen receptor, it cannot go through that whole transcriptional pathway where it can, you know, go into the nucleus, it dimerizes, and it binds to like different regions on the chromosomes. So you're not going to have all of that happening. It's especially important in the Wolfian ducts. What did we say the Wolfian ducts do? They're important for the development of the male internal genitalia. So the patient will not have male internal genitalia. They will have normally, they will develop normally functioning testes, which are often found in labia majora, and they have to be surgically removed to prevent malignancy. So again, the testes did not descend. This is because the androgens were not able to precipitate their effect. So here you do have androgens. It's just that they cannot do what they're supposed to do because they cannot bind to the androgen receptors and cause all of that protein synthesis to take place. And again, because the Wolfian dogs are affected, you're not going to have male internal genitalia. But because this person does have the XY karyotype, they are still male. So they're not going to develop female internal genitalia either because the anti-malarian hormone was there during development and it did cause involution of the malaria duct. So this person will have no internal genitalia. So there's going to be no internal genitalia. The external genitalia will typically develop as female and the phenotype is going to be identified as female. So again, because the default is kind of female, if you don't have, you know, androgens like acting where they should be acting and there's no development of male external genitalia, the default is kind of look like kind of going to look like female. So there, there's going to probably be a blind ending vaginal pouch. There's going to be no internal genitalia. This person will, at birth, they will present as female. So their parents are going to think they're, that's a female baby. So they're going to raise her as a girl. When she grows up, they're going to find out that she's not having her periods. 
and you know like there's all of these problems she's not having normal pubertal changes they're going to go to the doctor and they're going to find out that she actually does not have any internal genitalia and she is not um and like they're going to find out that she has androgen sensitivity syndrome um why is testosterone east why are testosterone estrogen and least levels elevated because there's a lack of development of the wolfian duct the pituitary will still produce lh leading to increased levels of testosterone and estrogen so the pituitary is like oh no the wolfian ducts did not develop um so we need to produce more of lh even after birth so like the pituitary is going to keep releasing it because uh you know the male internal genitalia is not developed so it thinks that we need to still develop it and it's going to release more lh this and this lh it's going to cause increased levels of testosterone and estrogen but thing is they can't really bind because there's no androgen receptors high levels of estrogen can lead to gynecomastia and androgen intensity syndrome has a wide spectrum of possible phenotypes of patients so there can be partial androgen insensitivity syndrome and there can be complete androgen insensitivity syndrome um, this is a table and this has all of the clinicals that we discussed. So what I would recommend you do is like you either cover up all of the different, you know, like columns. And as we I'll go through this and we'll quickly like do a summary of this and try and guess what like the etiology, the pathophysiology and the manifestation of each disease will be. So five alpha reductase. <laughs> this is supposed to be our favorite by now. Five alpha reductase efficiency. The etiology is that you cannot produce 5-alpha reductase enzyme. Okay, as a physiology, there is an, because you cannot produce the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, you cannot convert testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. And these patients will present with ambiguous internal genitalia and cryptorchidism. Androgenic steroid abuse. So these patients, they use exogenous androgens in excess. And because of that, there's going to be high levels of testosterone in the body, which will exert negative feedback on the HPG axis. They will present with aggression, acne, gynecomastia, um, testicular atrophy. In females, you would see hirsutism, acne, male pattern baldness, and breast atrophy. Then there's CYP19 aromatase deficiency, which is an ability in an inability to produce aromatase, and aromatase converts testosterone to estrogen. So if you don't have aromatase, you cannot convert testosterone to estrogen. So these patients, they will have a tall stature, they will have osteoporosis, they will have insulin resistance, and they will also have dyslipidemia, all because they cannot convert testosterone to estrogen. Then there's central precocious puberty, which is hypergonadism, which is one of the hypergonadism syndromes. Here, um, there's increased level of GnRH. This, is, this can be idiopathic or due to a tumor in the CNS. They cannot, there's going to be high levels of GnRH, and those high levels of GnRH are going to stimulate LH and FSH, which will stimulate the release of sex hormones. So there's going to be excess release of sex hormones. And because of that, there's going to be early appearance of sex, secondary sex characteristics. So there's going to be, you know, um, in females, you would see menstruation, you would see early development of the breasts, and male, you would see, you know, deepening of the voice. Um, um, they're going to, like, start growing taller earlier, but then they're going to also stop growing taller earlier and all of that. So then there's peripheral precocious security, which is also hypergonadism. It's uh, increased levels of sex hormones, and you can be it can be because of central... I'm oh, sorry, um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia or because of tumors. There's going to be excess sex hormones result and they're going to result in early onset of secondary sex characteristics. And again, you would see early appearance of secondary sex characteristics as you would see in central precocious puberty. Then there's primary hypogonadism, which is Klinefelter syndrome. So there's going to be impaired sex hormone production by gonads. So that's primary because the problem takes place in the gonads. If the problem would take place somewhere else, for example, in the hypothalamus, that's secondary. Um, you're going to have low sex hormone effects. Uh, so, sorry, you're going to have low sex hormones, and that's going to affect the development of primary and secondary sex characteristics. So they're going to present with testicular atrophy, unicoid body, erectile dysfunction, long extremities, female hair distribution, gynecomastia, 
Um, then there's secondary hypogonadism, which is Kalman syndrome. So here you're going to have abnormal TNR secretion because it's secondary. This is a problem in the CNS. So they're not going to be able to either release GNRH or release gonadotropins like FSH and LH. So they're going to have low levels of those two things, and that's going to lead to diminished production of sex hormones. They're going to present with cryptorchidism, delayed puberty, uh, microphallus, and anosmia. Again, anosmia is very characteristic of Kalman syndrome, and that happens because the GNRH neurons are not able to migrate to the hypothalamus. Then you have androgen insensitivity syndrome. Um, there's a hereditary defect in the X chromosome for the gene coding for the androgen receptor. So the Wolfian ducts do not possess the androgen receptor during embryonic development, so they cannot bind you know, the androgens. And because of that, they will not be able to differentiate into the internal genitalia. So the manifestation will be they're going to have, the patients will have female external genitalia, no internal genitalia, and they're going to have gynecomastia. Okay, now let's do a few more practice questions. Again, you can pause. Um, I will read the question and you can like, you can read it on your own. You can pause and you can answer it. And then I'm going to answer and explain the answer. So a birth control compound for men has been sought out for decades. Which substance would provide effective sterility? A substance that mimics the action of LH, not really. LH will lead to increased levels of testosterone, which is the opposite of sterility. Uh, a substance that mimics the action of inhibin, um, that could work, yes, because, you know, inhibin has negative feedback on the release of FSH. A substance that blocks the actions of FSH, a substance that mimics the action of GNRH. Okay, so this is also correct. And no, this is going to do the opposite. So... These two answers, they seem correct, but out of these two, the best option would be C. And why is that? Is because essentially you want to really get to the root of the root of the problem. Not really the problem, you know, the root of the action. So FS blocking FSH is directly going to affect the Sertoli cells. So the Sertoli cells will, you know, they're not gonna they're not gonna assist in spermatogenesis. So the inhibin, it's gonna go all the way up to pituitary, then it's gonna that it's gonna block FSH release from there. So instead of just blocking FSH release, it will be better just to block the action of FSH on the Sertoli cells themselves. Men who take large doses of testosterone, like androgenic steroids for long periods, are sterile in the reproductive sense of the word. What is the explanation for this finding? High levels of androgens bind to testosterone receptors in the Sertoli cells, resulting in overstimulation of inhibit formation. Overstimulation of sperm production results in the formation of defective sperm cells. High levels of androgen compounds inhibit the secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone by the hypothalamus, res re resulting in the inhibition of luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone released by the anterior, anterior pituitary. High levels of androgen compounds produce hypertrophic dysfunction of the prostate gland. Okay, so out of all of these options, this is the best option because we said that because you have these high levels of androgen, ex exogenous androgens, they're going to cause you know all of these problems um, in terms of like the HPG axis where they're going to start to inhibit the HPG axis even after you stop taking androgens. Okay, a scientist studying developmental physiology performs an experiment in which a substance is given to pregnant rats that give birth to pups that have XY chromosomes, but female and genital organs. What was the substance given to the rats? Okay, so it's a substance and they are, they do have the XY carrier type. They have female genital organs. An antibody that blocks the effect of human chorionic gonadotropin in the embryo and fetus, a large quantity of estrogen-like compounds, follicle-stimulating hormone, and testosterone. Okay, so here, um, you would see that, um, okay, so here you're, oh my god, we want my hand, ah, okay. Let's read this option. So an antibody that blocked the effect of human chronic gonadotropin in the embryo and fetus. We said that HCG um, is important for the development of the Wolfian 
a duct into internal genitalia. So this is this is a valid option, a large quantity of estrogen-like compounds that wouldn't really cause the genitalia to develop into female genitalia. Um, Follicle-stimulating hormone, again, that wouldn't cause, if they have an XY um, karyotype, that wouldn't cause them to develop into female genital organs. Testosterone, no, testosterone does the opposite. So the answer here is going to be A. Genetic testing of a fetus revealed a karyotype of 46 XY and a mutation in the androgen receptor. If the child were born with complete androgen receptor insensitivity syndrome, which of the following is expected? Um, so A, so the testes would be present. Okay, yes, the testes are supposed to be present. Ovaries present? No, ovaries are not supposed to be present because the gonadal cortex still regresses. Vast deference, absent. Um, okay, the vast deference uh, would be absent, yes, because there's not going to be any, um, what do you call it? There's a, uh, internal genitalia is not going to develop. Prostate would be absent, yes. The cervix would be, cervix would be present, no. Uh, the vagina would be present, yes. So this is, it's going to be present. Um, wait. So yeah, so this is wrong because, sorry, that took me a minute. This is wrong because the cervix should not be present. Next, the testes, again, yes, they should be present. Ovaries, they should be absent. Um, the vast deference, it should be absent. Okay, but I'm going to come back to this. The prostate female form, again, um, technically it should be absent. This is still fine. Cervix should be absent. Vagina should be present. Testes, no, this is not, this is immediately not correct. So we're not going to go through this because the testes should be present. This is not correct. Uh, female form, no, they should, they will be present, like normally functioning testes. So now here, the answer is actually B. Um, this is kind of a confusing question because we said that the internal genitalia would not develop. So again, this is supposed to be absent. This is just like one particular source that says that the vas deferens will be present. But I would suggest that you go by what we did in here and that we assume that the vas deferens would not be present because it's not supposed to be present. A 15-year-old female patient is concerned since she has not started her menstrual periods. She is phenotypically female and she dresses, behaves, and has the psychosocial outlook of a normal, well-adjusted teenage girl. On physical examination, she has normal female external genitalia, a blind ending vaginal canal, a uh, vagina, and no cervix. Imaging study, imaging study reveals no uterus but intrapelvic gonads, which on biopsy turned out to be testicular tissue. Karyotyping shows that the patient is 46XY, which is the following is the most likely diagnosis. Again, she's a young girl who has not started her menstrual periods. She is phenotypically females and she dresses, behaves, and has a psychosocial outlook of a normal teenage girl. She has normal female external genitalia, blind ending vagina. So there's no uterus, there's no cervix. So she has no internal genitalia. She has intrapelvic gonads, which are tes testes. So she does have testes. Again, they will have testes, but they won't have any um, internal genitalia. So this is pointing towards androgen insensitivity syndrome. Why is this not 5-alpha reductase? 5 alpha reductase, again, the patient will present at puberty with a microphallus um, because they, they do have testosterone being produced. So in 5-alpha reductase, the problem is you can't form DHT. In androgen insensitivity, you don't have receptors for the androgen. So no androgen can bind in, in the cell. So you will not have any androgenic effects. So this is androgen insensitivity syndrome. A young man discusses with his physician that he seems incapable of conceiving a child with his wife. Upon physical examination, small and firm testes, moderate gynecomastia, poor beard growth, sparse body hair, long, thin arms and legs, narrow shoulders, and wide hips are found. Laboratory tests show decreased levels of testosterone and increased levels of LH and FSH. There are no spermatozoa in the ejaculate. Karyotyping and additional analysis would most likely indicate which of the following. Again, 
small firm testi so it's testicular atrophy gynecomastia poured beard growth sparse body hair long thin arms and legs so his limbs are long and he has narrow shoulders and his hips are wide and he has high levels of fsh and lh there are no spermatozoa in the ejaculate so he has uh, 47 XXY, which is Klinefelter syndrome, because that's, this is the presentation of Klinefelter syndrome, where the testes are unable to produce androgens, and because his testes are unable to produce androgens, he cannot produce spermatozoa. This is called a azoospermia, and because of that, he, and also, because of that, he cannot conceive, and he also presents with all of these other secondary sex characteristics, and high levels of LH and FSH, so the answer would be D. Um, okay, so that's it for me. Um, please make sure you scan this QR code. This is just a feedback survey for the session. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I would be more than happy to help. And good luck with your studies. Good luck with your exams. And with Ramadan and yeah.